Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to This Week in FCPA for the week ending July 22nd. Today Jay and I take up a series of topics that uh, came up this past week in the FCPA and compliance world. The first is the new Stanford Law School free FCPA database. Next we briefly touch on the serious fraud office opening up an investigation against Una Oil. We talk about the uh, presentation by the law firm of Brian Cave on their FCPA benchmarking webinar. We also take a deep dive into the near settlement of J.P. Morgan Chase and the Princeling and Princessing Ling case of hiring sons and daughters of Chinese government officials. And finally, we end up with the new, or rather the um, forfeiture action filed this week by the Department of Justice involving the funds allegedly stolen from the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund by members of the family of the Prime Minister and close personal friends of the Prime Minister of Malaysia. Some of this money uh, made its way to Hollywood in the form of money used to produce the film The Wolf of Wall Street. So Jay gives us a tutorial on movie financing and all its Byzantine intricacies. As always, the episode comes in at uh, 30 minutes. I hope you've enjoyed, uh, will enjoy rather, this episode. Jay and I certainly had a good time bringing it to you. And I hope that you will come back next Friday for our next episode of This Week in FCPA with Jay Rosen and Tom Fox. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. and I'd like to welcome you to This Week in FCPA with my good friend and colleague, Jay Rosen. Jay, uh, welcome and good morning on this Friday, July 22nd. Good morning, Tom. Looking forward to uh, discussing the week that was. So the uh, we've uh, cracked the 100 mark here in Houston for five straight days. So it's been a lovely July summer. Um, how about uh, the weather and it never rains in Southern California? Uh, before starting the car, it said 112 yesterday. So uh the San Fernando Valley is like uh, Vegas without the neon. Okay. And uh, as I recall, your uh, two lovely daughters are back from camp. And is it uh, complete chaos or just regular chaos? Uh, no, this week they are taking a kids cooking camp at Sur La Table. So Ooh. for hours every morning, they've been learning their, honing their knife skills. And the first night they made us spaghetti carbonara. So uh, the are having a great time and uh, today is their last cooking class and then next week is complete chaos. So my daughter is uh, visiting from uh, her summer home in Ashland, Oregon and she, when I asked her where she wanted to go for last night in uh, Houston next week, she said, I want to cook you guys dinner. So uh, we're going to have her cook us dinner. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. All right, we so, need a menu report. Yes, yes. Well, Jay, we had a really uh, an interesting week, I thought. No um, enforcement actions announced, but a lot of uh, other things going on. So even uh, when it might appear that uh, we've hit a lull, there's actually a, a fair amount to talk about. So um, one of the things that was announced this week that uh, I wouldn't say was really stunning, but is going to be, I think, of great use is Stanford has put together this free FC, FCPA database, uh, and it's a, a law school um, library, which is going to be a great resource for the, uh, the compliance community as a whole. And they slice and dice information in ways that uh, they're interested in that we can certainly utilize. Now, uh, but they also have the raw documents or, or the background documents to everything. So if you want to take a deep dive into something, did you get a chance to take a look at it? And uh, if so, uh, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, uh, I got to play around with it, and um, one of the neat things is you can slice and dice that data up to uh, or buy 40 different attributes. So um, there's a lot of folks in the community who are always looking for data points on your ethics and compliance program, and I think this is a great tool, number one, because it's free, and number two, because it's updated consistently in real time. So it's uh, in the past, we've had to rely upon some of our big law firm uh, colleagues who put together annual and semi-annual reports. And now if you're going out to uh, run training in a month, you can actually pull the most recent data. And, uh, you know, there's graphs in there. So I think that this is going to be uh, a great tool for the FCPA ethics and compliance community. 
Uh, the second thing is uh, there was a um, Brian K webinar that you were able to attend uh, that you thought had some really useful information. So uh, why don't you tell us about that? Sure. So uh, this was a, a webinar that was online a couple days ago. And uh, in my weekend read, I will provide links to both the uh, replay of the webinar and the slides. And it was uh, moderated by uh, Mark Swery and his two colleagues, Andrew Moraz and Kristen Robinson. And what they did is uh, essentially it's uh, benchmarking your FCPA program. But what they did in a very uh, timely manner was they tied it to the recent Vipulcom ruling and kind of took a look at where, uh, which stages within the FCPA pilot program were satisfied by that. And then they take a look at just some other um, good uh, sources to benchmark to. So I thought, you know, with this uh, not really being driven towards any um, specific event, this is a great place for you to kind of catch up. We're mid-year in the summer. If you want to look at your compliance program, kind of look at the training materials that you're de developed for this year and what you want to work on towards the end of next year and with budget season coming up. I thought this would be a great, uh, you know, opportunity and, and something good to offer to our uh, listeners and readers. Uh, I agree. And uh, I'm going to put that in the show notes for uh, this podcast as well. You mentioned your weekend uh, wrap up, and I wanted to ask you about that at some point. Uh, what are you going to talk about uh, uh, in the wrap up? When's it coming out and where can people find it? Sure. Thank you. So the, I've been uh, right now posting the wrap up uh, to LinkedIn, which you can find if you just go to my profile. And uh, this week, we're, we're going to talk about um, the SFOs uh, beginning uh, declarations into the unit oil situation. We're going to talk about the uh, recent Wall Street Journal article about um, JP Morgan Chase and the Princelings. We'll have the uh, presentation by Brian Cave. And then we'll also have those links to the um, new Stanford database. So a little bit of something for everyone. And what I try to do is uh, kind of springboard off some of the things that you and I uh, speak about during the week and then anything else that's of interest to me that might be a, a good deep dive for our, our readers. So how, how I know uh, LinkedIn now has, uh, the, uh, you have the ability on LinkedIn and, and I think you and I both have done it to, um, to post articles, uh, certainly within your own um, profile, you can add information. But uh, do you actually post this as an article on that LinkedIn function or do you use some other mechanism through LinkedIn? No, so you actually um, go into, there's a button that says, uh, you know, publish a post and you can go in there and you can drop in whatever photo you want. And then what I typically do is I write my blog ahead of time in Word with the hard links, um, the hyperlinks in it, and then I just cut and paste it. But it's uh, it's really an easy tool to use. And even within the tool for LinkedIn, there is an ability to change fonts, to do bolds, to do um, I, uh, italics, and then you can also actually add those hyperlinks right within LinkedIn. So it's uh, it's easy enough that um, you know a former guy from the motion picture business can do it. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. The, uh, the thing that I really like about it is it broadcasts or at least makes available to your entire LinkedIn audience and those who you've connected with uh, or linked with, I suppose is the right term, uh, the information. So uh, when you post that, I get that on my LinkedIn feed and I would assume everyone else that you're linked with as well. So it's really a great uh, new feature. It's been around about six months maybe, I think, uh, but it's a great feature of LinkedIn. There's some really interesting posts that people are putting up uh, and I found it to be a, a very useful tool as well. Yeah, and, and the other thing that's great about it is it's, um, you know, there is no uh, regimented size of article. You don't have to put up X number of words. So, you know, sometimes less is more. And, you know, especially if you look at the kind of stuff that's uh, sp purposely posted on the FCPA blog, it's really just to give somebody the kernel of the idea and then, uh, you know, if you can provide some rele relevant links, um, I find that's really useful to people who are busy, who don't have the time to uh, scour the Internet in the uh, uh, FCPA Inc. like you and I do. So uh, I've gotten some great feedback from folks amongst yourself. So uh, I'm having fun doing it and it'll post either uh, later this afternoon or first thing uh, tomorrow morning. 
and uh, once again, proving the maxim of location, location, location by posting on the weekend. You're the only uh, uh, commentator in the uh, compliance space that I'm aware of that posts regularly on the weekend. So you've got sort of that location to yourself. So kudos for uh, either thinking of that or falling into it. I don't know which, but uh, you're the only guy doing it. So it's, uh, it's nice to be the king of location <laughs> on Saturday. So shall we talk to some more entertainment? We should. So what does the Wolf of Wall Street have to do with compliance, money laundering, and to this week in the FCPA? Uh, well, what we're going to talk about from the Hollywood perspective is film financing. And uh, well, as let's many up, of you... Let's set, up, let's set up what happened first. So okay. if I could talk about the United States government filed its largest civil forfeiture uh, lawsuit uh, involving funds allegedly stolen from the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which has the name 1MDB. Uh, the allegations in the civil suit are basically that the prime minister, although not named in the suit, identified as a, a, a senior uh, government official one, close friends and members of his family basically looted the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund or used it as collateral to take loans for personal use. The civil suit alleges a wide variety of personal sp expenditures, personal properties purchased, homes in Hollywood, Bel Air, New York, Miami, um, gambling uh, junkets in the multi-millions of dollars. I don't know how you lose multi-millions of dollars gambling in one trip, but apparently there's ways to do it. Uh, but the one that caught our eye was uh, our good friend, uh, your good friend, I should say, uh, Mr. DiCaprio and uh, the Wolf of Wall Street, because uh, one of the funding uses of the forlorn funds was the uh, filming, excuse me, the financing of the Wolf of Wall Street. So I thought it would be a good opportunity for you to explain the absolute Byzantine ways that Hollywood funds movies and how money that was stolen from a sovereign wealth fund could work its way into a major Hollywood production. Sure. So uh, I'll try not to go too far back in history, but uh, when I was in the motion picture business from about 1987 to 2000, um, at that point, the large studios that you have, such as uh, you know 20th Century Firemont, Warner Brothers, um, they were a little bit more, not much more than just being a financing entity. So no longer did you have studios that were really developing their own projects. People would bring in a script, slot Leo in, and they give financing. And, you know, basically the studio is, is used to using OPM, other people's money. They want someone else to shoulder all the risk to pay for the films. And then if it's a good film, you know, if it's, uh, you know, if it's Batman or if it's, you know, Iron Man, you're going to want to finance that yourself as the studio because you want the majority of the profits. But if it's something a little bit less riskier or maybe arty, it's a Martin Scorsese movie, you don't want to shoulder all that risk. So you're going to either bring in uh, some of the large investment banks, put together funds, which are pools of money that are used to finance the movie. In this situation, they brought their own financing to the table, which is the, uh, you know, the uh, entity that was formed by the folks who allegedly have looted the Malaysian government. So at that point, the money's good. And, uh, you know, now the question is, uh, the DOJ, SEC, love to uh, complete industry sweeps. So uh, my question is, are we going to look at other independently financed movies? And are we going to see, was this a vehicle, number one, to wash cash? And number two, uh, is there anything untoward that happened? So the Wall Street Journal had done some very interesting reporting uh, on this case, but also on this particular film specifically. And in uh, some prior articles by uh, my friend Chris Matthews and some of his colleagues, they talked about the uh, shell corporations that the money was laundered through to get to the uh, financing vehicle for this particular film and the, the steps that uh, the money went through, those were laid out in even greater detail in the uh, civil action. And uh, you bring up a very interesting question, which is if you are involved with a 
a third party, a partner, a joint venture partner, a, 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 some sort of um, business relationship where some, the other team is bringing money to the table. What's your responsibility to uh -huh. uh, look at the source of those funds? So if I buy a house, uh, my bank wants to know where did I get the money to put up for the down payment? And then certainly they want to see a income stream that would allow uh -huh. repayment of the loan. But here we're not asking for a repayment alone. We have a financing, a, excuse me, a production company coming saying we have money, we have financing. How does a studio, why would that not be attractive to a studio if a producing company comes with a script, a star, and the money to do it? What's the role of the studio in that situation is simply as a distributor? Uh, yeah, so a lot of times you will have a, a finished film and it will play at Sundance, it'll play at a film festival. And then, you know, at that point, you can have a, a bidding war and then a studio will acquire distribution rights. So I don't know specifically what the history was of Wolf of Wall Street. It may just be that um, oftentimes in the past, producers would cobble together funds. So they'd get two million from Italy and five million from Germany. And the way they get this money is through pre-sales. So you can either pre-sale the film and finance it yourself, and then you're taking the risk that this is gonna be a good enough movie that the studios are gonna bid for it, or the studios own their tentpole franchises like Star Wars, Indiana Jones, and that. And at that point, that's their own intellectual property that they're funding. So um, more and more, uh, larger studios are distribution entities as opposed to production entities. So in the case of Paramount, they were probably just picking up domestic rights. The question would be is that when you're filming these large pools of cash to finance a slate of movies, are people specifically looking at those people who are contributing to this pool of cash and are they doing the diligence on whether this money is clean or is this money potentially being laundered? So how is that different than if Jay Rosen starts Michaela's Unicorn Company and you're going to uh -huh. actually manufacture a, uh, you've created a virtual unicorn that uh, kids can play with. And you come to me and say, I've come up with this idea. I'd like, Tom, I'd like your funding um, to help me start this, this entity up. And I give you uh, an appropriate amount of funding. You move forward and you actually create a product. But you, as the creator, need a distribution network. So you go to Amazon, you go to Walmart, you go to Target, and you show them uh, uh, that you have created this virtual unicorn that uh, you would like to sell at their store. So how is the model I've just described where I might invest in you as a startup and you would use that seed money to develop a product, but you would still have to go to find a dis distributor uh, of your product. How is that different than the, the money that's used in the film industry to create a production and then go to a studio to, and utilize the studio as the distributor? Uh, I, I would think essentially it's the same thing. The, uh, uh, question is, is that I'm not a public corporation, right? I'm just uh, Jay Rosen. Right. So if I'm raising seed money, VC money, uh, is the responsibility on me to check out the beneficial ownership of those people who are my investors? Well, typically, is a production company a public company? Uh, I wouldn't say so. I, I would say it's a private entity. So if it's... Uh, private entity and then you would go to a public company a, a studio for distribution rights or, or some distribution really I, I guess I don't see the difference between that and then you taking uh, Michaela's unicorns to Amazon which of course is a public company and distributing through uh, through Amazon well so are we opening up a whole nother can of worms now for every publicly traded retailer and internet then and internet uh, portal well, uh, I think certainly that uh, if you came and said, I have Jay's Canadian medicines, uh, comma, with no FDA approval in uh, comma, that I'd like to sell. Would, would they idea. be in a box with a, a green plus sign on them? Yeah, that one. Uh, you know, <laughs> I think that a, distri a distributor such as Amazon or Walmart or FedEx uh, might uh, 
be required to ask a question or two there. Uh, but if your product is not illegal, uh, typically I don't think that's something that a distributor would, would inquire in. So maybe the answer is, or part of the equation is, if uh, in, in the filmmaking business, when a production company comes with its own financing, does any of that financing actually pass over to the distribution company, the, the studio, or does it stay with the production company for use in the production only? Uh, I would say it's the latter. Uh, it also depends on where that uh, production gets incorporated, right? So they may um, incorporate themselves as a Canadian company or an Australian company to get there's a lot of tax incentives that right. different foreign companies, uh, countries offer, which has really lured a lot of production away from the from California and then even different states. There's uh, big production hubs that have developed in North Carolina and Atlanta. So, um, you know, I, I guess another thing to really look about is if you're getting um, benefits from shooting in a certain state. Uh, how legitimate are those? You know, it's basically somebody's giving you um, a rebate or they're paying you um, a certain amount of money to bring your production to their state. Are they gaining an unfair advantage by doing that? Well, if the government grants that tax abatement or uh, makes the payment, I think the answer uh, is no, because you have a public government making a public government decision. Uh, whether you agree with that decision or not is a separate issue, but if they want to give a tax abatement to bring a production company to film in Texas or Louisiana or any other state, that's certainly a well-known uh, mechanism for attracting business, but it's uh, across all industries. Tax abatements are uh, routinely given to businesses, certainly here in the great state of Texas, and I suspect uh, in other states as well. Um, so uh, now, you also mentioned a different model that the studios would use, which is they would actually make the movie themselves. Did you ever work on any movies that the studio itself was producing? Sure. When I was at uh, 20th Century Fox in uh, the mid-90s, uh, I helped uh, produce a slate of movies that went from um, Speed and Mrs. Doubtfire all the way to Alien 3. So uh, again, most of those movies, since we were uh, running the physical production at 20th Century Fox, we were in charge of the budget and what was happening. So the thing that happens is from the moment a movie is greenlit, we would get a script, we would break it down, we would figure out how much it costs to shoot every scene, and then we'd go ahead and sign the key contracts with the creative people, directors of photography, uh, art designers, people like that. So at that point, if it was 100% owned production for of 20th Century Fox, we would be the people running point on that. There still could be um, a slate of capital that 20th Century Fox was leveraging to pay for those production costs. But it was, you know, definitely a studio production. On the ones where we didn't have oversight, we wouldn't have anyone monitoring how the money was being spent and they would just be, you know, responsible for delivering us uh, a negative cut of, you know, 100 minutes or 120 minutes. And that would be the only obligation they would have to fulfill. So with the, when the studio produces its own uh, movie, it's, it's uh, closer akin to a manufacturer manufacturing their own product, funding it mm -hmm. um, through its own internal resources, loans, uh, sell of stock or any other mechanism to raise money that they might need. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, uh, but uh, really interesting, this, uh, we uh, have focused here on the film industry, but I don't want the audience to, to misunderstand the significance of this forfeiture action. This is by far and away the largest the U.S. government has ever filed. Um, it is filed uh, really against a key U.S. ally, political ally in uh, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, been a friend of the United States for a long time. Uh, key, uh, a very large Muslim company, uh, com country, and uh, Malaysia has uh, been an ally in the, the fight against uh, worldwide terrorism. So a lot going on here. Uh, we'll certainly have to uh, see how this plays out. It involves people up to the uh, the family members of the prime minister directly. So uh, what the fallout's going to be, uh, we don't know. 
Uh, there's one other matter that uh, we wanted to go into a little bit, and that is the princeling case. So, Jay, why don't you explain what a princeling, or in your case, prince Prince Essling might be, and this might be a good time to bring the princess on board. Does any, anybody want to get on screen and say good morning? Yeah. No. They're, they're taking a pass. Okay. So the princesses are not available for comment on this lab session, but perhaps we can get them back for an, another session for additional comment. I, I think if we book them ahead of time, they would be happy to consult with their publicist, Rebecca. Okay. Okay. So, so with the with the Prince Links matters, uh, we're looking at an investigation that uh, initially at this point has been has touched J.P. Morgan Chase, but it's uh, looking at other global investment banks. And what the at issue is here is whether or not they had hired qualified uh, interns and people to work at the bank, and whether or not that there was an incentive that by hiring the son or daughter of a government official, a foreign government official, was this a way for the investment banks to get an unfair advantage and to get further business from these people? So it's, you know, squarely right in the um, crosshairs of FCPA that somebody is undertaking an action with a foreign representative of a, gov of a government to obtain or maintain business. Did I say that right? Very good, very good recitation. So in an article in today's Wall Street Journal, uh, by once again, shout out to my friend uh, Chris Matthews, but also his colleagues, Emily Glazer and Aruna Viswanathan, they uh, reported that uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is near a settlement with the Department of Justice. And the figures that uh, bantered, bantied around in the article were, were pretty uh, outstanding in the rate of $200 million. Uh, at this point, there is no criminal uh, sanctions to be levied, um, uh, at least at this stage in the negotiations. The, um, this, Jay, this case follows on two uh, that we previously had, uh, Bank of New York uh, Mellon, uh, BMI uh -huh. Mellon, and Qualcomm. And the thing that struck me is in those two cases, and indeed as reported in the J.P. Morgan Chase case, as reported by the Wall Street Journal, was the lack of qualifications of the sons and daughters, the princelings and princessinglings hired by these investment banks. Um, the, uh, the question I'm asked uh, occasionally is, can I hire the son or daughter of a foreign government official? If that foreign government official is the person in charge of your contract, uh, I would say I would say the more conservative approach would be no. But uh, if you, perhaps if you ring fence uh, that person uh, that hire, you can uh, go ahead and employ them in your company. But they absolutely positively have to meet the minimum hiring qualifications of your company. And uh, the um, both the prior cases. Uh, Bank of New York Mellon and Qualcomm quoted extensively from email traffic demonstrating that in, in Bank of New York Mellon's case, the uh, candidates did not even meet the hiring criteria. And then, of course, after they were hired, there were uh, issues raised about the quality of their work product. In uh, Qualcomm, the uh, hiring process uh, identified the candidate as not qualified to work at Qualcomm. His uh, work product was substandard. In the uh, J.P. Morgan case, at least in the emails reported by the journal, uh, the uh, candidates were not qualified, and one candidate actually sexually harassed someone in HR. So, um, you know, I guess that would be put you on double secret probation. Um, oh, and uh, I would, uh, uh, for those of you who have read my blog, I have to say that uh, I recommend you today. I don't know what that means. Uh, also, uh, so the key is... Do they meet your minimum hiring requirements? If they don't, it's full stop. You can't hire them, period. Uh, it's going to be a uh, FCPA violation. If they're not qualified, they're a son or a daughter of somebody who can send you business and you can hire them. Uh, but then the question becomes, what do you do if they are qualified? And when the J.P. Morgan case first broke, I was at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they used to have a uh, two-day conference in uh, New York, Washington, D.C., uh, FCPA and compliance conference, and they had a panel of CCOs to talk about this issue. And uh, they said that if it, they go through the regular hiring process and they meet all of the qualifications and you can ring fence them away from working on their father's or uh, spouse's, excuse me, parents' uh, account, 
then then you can uh, consider hiring them. It's um, I uh, I like to use that as an example of something that is uh, a standard business practice, but it's actually high risk in the FCPA. High risk does not mean you can do it. high risk means that you have to manage it with a high level of management, and that means you have to follow the internal controls in hiring. Yes, HR has internal controls. And if you violate those internal controls by overriding the hiring process, that's a violation of FCPA compliance internal controls, even though you call that the hiring process. So um, a lot going on here. The, uh, the amount of $200 million is, frankly, Jay, is just stunning uh, to have that high a dollar fine for uh, this type of hiring. It, it speaks to the uh, overall comprehensiveness of the uh, process. It was... Uh, I think an eight to 10 year program. There were approximately 200 or so um, princes and princesslings hired. So um, uh, it's going to be very interesting uh, to see that. So unfortunately, and, and, we're uh, near the bottom of the hour. So uh, what were your thoughts? And then go to some final comments. Yeah. So I was just going to say um, the way I was reading the article is that that's not even a definite. There's uh uh, a year end coming up on September 30th and right. w with any, um, you know, th they might wait until after November and see what the new administration has to say and whether or not that would change anything. So I think there's still a lot of moving parts there on, on this one. So, but to your point, the number is uh, very significant and it, it definitely does bear watching on uh, the community's part. So uh, any final thoughts on the wrap up of a week ending July 22nd? Uh, final thoughts. The Red Sox are back in first place. So we're happy about that. And yeah. we really uh, missed the opportunity last week to talk about um, the end finally of deflate gate. So uh, I I'm happy to be moving on from that. And uh, what do we say? Uh, Have you as, reached acceptance? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I just figured, you know, more than a year and a half on this thing, uh, we all need to move on. I still uh, have a feeling that Commissioner Goodell will have something to pay, and if Mr. Kraft has anything to say about that, but I will take my satisfaction down the line. And uh, we are on to, uh, who, who's my other quarterback now? Uh, Grappolo? Yeah, Jimmy Grappolo. We're on to Grappolo, him. yeah. yeah. So, uh, how about you? How about college as uh, Tony Romo. He did. Yep. yep. So the Astros are three and a half games out. Uh, I went to my first game this year uh, on the ninth uh, for my birthday. So uh, I'm back. Astros are back. I'm back. I'm back in the fold. And uh, hopefully we will overtake the Rangers. If not, <laughs> we will garner another uh, wild card slot. Uh, I can't promise you we'll knock out the Yankees for you like we did last year. Uh, I'm not sure they're going to make it this year, but, uh, you know, perhaps we will meet in the playoffs at some point. That, that would be great because it's always nice to have a, a friendly wager. <laughs> All right, Jay. Well, uh, thanks a lot and look forward to visiting with you next week on next week's This Week in FCPA. Have a great weekend, everybody, and thanks for listening and watching.